Salam sejahtera. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. Yang berhormat Datuk Seri Dr. Norani Ahmad, Minister of Higher Education Malaysia. Yang berbahagia Datuk Seri Dr. Mazlan Yusof, Secretary General Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia. Professor Dr. Nordin Yahya, Director, Higher Education Leadership Academy, ACAP Malaysia. Professor Datuk Dr. Ekwan Toreman, Vice Chancellor, University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Distinguished speakers, Professor Datuk Dr. Ahmad Bashawe Haji Abdul Ghani, Vice Chancellor, University Utara Malaysia. Professor Dr. Arif Satria, Rector, IPB University, Bogor, Indonesia. Dr. Moon Suk An, Vice President for International Affairs, Jeonbuk National University, South Korea. Dr. Sergio Antonio Silva Munoz, Provost for Academic Affairs, University of Guanajuato, Mexico. Moderator, Professor Dr. Rosna Awang Hashim, Academy of Professor Malaysia and Professor at University of Utara, Malaysia. Honorable guests, participants from all across the world who join us this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Port ACAP Global Series President Forum in collaboration with University Kebangsaan Malaysia with the theme, Universities Leadership in Challenging Times and the Way Forward. I am Tanur Unja, Deputy Director of International Relations Center, UKM, your MC for today's webinar. We know today most of university leaders are confronted with overwhelming challenges and uncharted water as they resume to navigate the global pandemic aftermath. This webinar is indeed timely as we seek build a lighthouse at a hidden rocky or build a rope to navigate the higher education journey. We are honored and grateful to have an assemblage of presidents and their representatives to share their thought, experience, and visions. To begin today's webinar, we are honored to have the Minister of Higher Education Malaysia, Yang Bahormat Datuk Sri Dr. Nurani Ahmad, to deliver the welcoming speech. Thank you, Sri Dr. Mazlan Yusuf, Secretary General, Minister of Higher Education Malaysia, Professor Dr. Nordin Yahya, Director, Higher Education Leadership Academy, Malaysia. Professor Dr. Dr. Ikwan Haji Toriman, Vice Chancellor, University of Bangsa Malaysia. Professor Dr. Dr. Ahmad Bashawi Haji Abdul Ghani, Vice Chancellor, University of Utara Malaysia. Professor Dr. Arif Satria, Rector, IPB University Indonesia. Dr. Man Suk And, Vice President for International Affairs. Jubuk National University, South Korea. Dr. Sergio Antonio Silva Munoz, Provost for Academic Affairs, the University of Guanajuato, Mexico. Professor Dr. Rosna Awang Hashim, Academy of Professors Malaysia and University Utara Malaysia, university representatives from Malaysia across the world, ladies and gentlemen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning, afternoon, and evening to all the speakers and attendees of our webinar today. My fellow honorable speakers and participants. I wish to extend a very warm welcome to the fourth RCAP Global Talk Series, a collaborative effort between the Higher Education Leadership Academy and University of Bangsa and Malaysia. The program gathers university presidents across the world and their representatives to share their insights and thoughts on issues surrounding international higher education. And today, we are honored to have such distinguished panel of experts who share their experiences and wisdom as university leaders. This webinar 
will align towards the strategic alternatives needed for the way forward in the era where internationalization is faced with restrictions and challenges. The team, university's leadership in challenging times and the way forward aims at ensuring the aptitude of higher education institutions to analyze the recruitment strategies and execute a tactical gambit to draw in global students' audiences as well as university partners through a keen focus on value-added recruitment. This debate will also highlight the importance of university leaders to address pressing issues on matters of sustainability, addressing the need for technological advancement and how effective leadership strategies can keep the faculties and research institutions intact, as well as motivating academic communities and universities' employees. We acknowledge that the current pandemic situation brings great impacts from different features of global societies. Consequently, in dealing with unpredictable challenges of higher education institutions, which require strong transformational leaders to search for strategic imperatives in positioning the institutions and bringing sustainability in universities up to the next level henceforth. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope from today's discussion, university leaders will be able to share their experience and demonstrate the institution's relevance by reviving learning environments so that digitalization expands and complements the student-teacher and student-student interactions. I hope by today's webinar, all of us will gain insight on how to prioritize in leading our institutions forward. Dear speakers and attendees, to keep abreast with the current development of the pandemic, the leaders need to be quick in adapting to the current norm caused by the pandemic. This ability to quickly adapting to the current norm is applicable to all, not only to the leaders. There will be plans that are not feasible due to the current factors, but a great leader will learn from the challenges and adapt thus will come up with better strategies and plans. To all of us in Malaysia, internationalization is embracing the new norms in the manners of online meetings, online conferences, and various forms of online communication. The strategic collaborations are coming in a new forms as communications and discussion are now rapidly done online. Even though physical internationalization is limited, the virtual internationalization is incorporating itself slowly but surely. And I believe this is the way to go forward now. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that all of you will gather new knowledge and gain new insights from today's webinar. Indeed, I truly believe that it is timely for us to hold this webinar to listen to the challenges, struggles, and inspiring stories of these leaders and how they are positioning their universities in moving forward. I would like to express my deepest thanks to both RCAP and UKM for collaborating in coming up with this prestigious event. Our camp as a higher education leadership academy working with UKM, one of the premium research universities in Malaysia, provides a synergy that will bring excellence in global education. 
with Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I hereby officiate RCAP Global Series University President Forum in collaboration with UKM on the team titled University's Leadership in Challenging Times and the Way Forward. Thank you very much and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Yang Bahormat Dato Suri. In the spirit of moving forward together in this challenging and defining time, let us keep the ball rolling. And I would like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Professor Dr. Rosna Awang Hashim. Professor Dr. Rosna Awang Hashim is an educational psychologist and motivations scientist at the School of Education, University of Utara, Malaysia. Currently, She's also a member of Board of Governors at Al-Bukhari International University and the Assistant Secretary General Academy of Professors Malaysia. She obtained a bachelor degree and master degree from University of North Texas and completed her PhD from University of Southern California specializing in educational psychology. She is an active researcher, a regular invited speaker and trainer. Over the last 31 years at University of Utara, Malaysia, she has served in various leadership capacities, including director of ICRAC, Institute for Child and Adolescence Educational Advancements, dean of the School of Education and director of the Center for University Teaching and Learning. Her last position was as deputy vice chancellor, academic and international of University of Utara, Malaysia. Please welcome Professor Dr. Rosina Awang Hashim. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanod, for your kind introduction. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and very good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Good afternoon. Uh, our distinguished guests, esteemed panelists, and participants out there on Zoom and FB Live, welcome to this session. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today, actually. Thank you so much for ACAP and also UKM for giving me this platform. Uh, because higher education is something that uh, you're so passionate about, especially during this crisis moment. Uh, challenges that we're facing, I think this has become a very crucial issues for everyone in higher education. And, and you see today's university leaders are confronted with huge challenges like we mentioned earlier by the minister. They had to navigate the global pandemic aftermath. So I hope today we can learn wisdom and experiences, inspiring experiences from four different countries. And, and at the same time, we're trying to make sense how future higher education will be informed by our prior experience, if there is any that we can learn from, and also our ability and foresight to reimagine the future of higher education. During these critical moments, university leaders ought to demonstrate the institution's relevance from providing meaningful online learning experiences to recreate perhaps sustainable financial model and not to mention also impact to society. So it's among some of the pivotal questions often raised in academia is, what is the future of the universities? What will be the new strategic imperatives in the new normal? And how does an institution gain global prominence yet maintain a local relevance? Well, there's tough, tough question to be deliberated today. So to discuss these issues, we are proud to bring four uh, distinguished uh, leaders from universities around the globe. Uh, allow me to introduce four gentlemen today with us. Our first speaker is Professor Dr. Dr. Ahmad Bashawir Haji Abdogani. He's the Vice Chancellor of University of Uttara Malaysia. Uh, he holds an MBA in financial management from University of Hull, United Kingdom, and a PhD in commerce from Murdoch University, Australia. He's an expert in international business management, which includes international business, business research, strategic alliances, policy modeling, and business economics. Prior to joining UUM, he worked in a number of public and private sector organizations in Malaysia and abroad, 
where he was involved in various economic, strategic, and business research projects spanning most sectors of the economy. As the vice chancellor for a management university, he has a vision and mission for University of Uttara Malaysia to become the Harvard of the East and transition to an internationally focused institution that partners with a range of leading global universities and multinational organization. Welcome, Dato. Our second speaker, Professor Dr. Arif Satria. Uh, is he here yet? Uh, let me introduce Professor Arif. He will may be joining us later. Uh, he's a rector of International Pertanya Bogo or IPB uh, University, Indonesia. He received his bachelor's degree in socioeconomics and master's degree in rural, rural sociology from the Faculty of Agriculture, IPB, earned his doctorate in marine policy from the University of Kagoshima, Japan. He's currently chairman of the Indonesian Forum of Rectors for the year 2020. Previously, he was advisor to the Indonesian Minister of Marine and Fisheries back in 2012. Professor Arif has been actively involved in the development of marine and fisheries policies since 2002, including the preparation of the Blue Economic Concept, as well as a number of government and ministerial regulation. Welcome, Professor Arif. Our third speaker from Mexico, Professor mm -hmm. Dr. Sergio Antonio Silva Munoz. Welcome, Dr. Silva. He's a professor of the Department of Civil Engineering and a provost at Academic Affairs at the University of Guanajuato. He's a civil engineer by training, graduated from the University of Guanajuato, a master and doctor of engineering from Tokyo Institute of Technology, and a graduate from the Building Research Institute of Japan. Previously, hmm. Professor Silva has served as director of the Office of International Relations and Academic Collaboration and General Coordinator of Academic Development in Guanajuato campus of UG. He has vast experience in international research collaboration and has published widely and has lectured in various countries, including Mexico, United States, Asia, Europe, and Central America. He has participated as special guests of the Japan Society of Civil Engineering and also the Academy of Sciences Malaysia and the Institute of Lowland and Marine Research in Japan. Welcome, Professor Silva again. And finally, from South Korea, we brought here today Dr. Mu Su An. He's a vice president for international affairs and professor in the Department of Political Science and Diplomacy at John Book National University, South Korea. He received his bachelor's degree from Seoul National University, master's from York University, and PhD from Warwick University in the UK. His main interests are international relations, North Korean politics, and foreign policy of North and South Korea. He has published numerous papers and books dealing with Northeast Asian international relations, North Korea, and Korea and US relations. Currently, he's in charge of international cooperation concerning John Burke National University Korea. Welcome, Dr. Ant, and thank yep. you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us today. Yeah. Well, we don't have much time. We have about one hour to deliberate on several issues that we want to bring up today. Sure. So ladies and gentlemen, before we begin this session, I would like also to invite our participants out there, I believe several hundred participants on Zoom and also on Facebook Live. If you have any question, please post the question in our chat box in the Zoom and also in in the Facebook Live. We are going to collect some of the questions, but I cannot promise we can entertain all questions due to time constraint, but I'll, we try my very best to entertain a few. Mm. Well, let's get the ball rolling. So I, be, I would like to begin this session with looking back at the crisis management during the first phase of pandemic. Uh, we can see that the pandemic 19, COVID-19 has impacted higher education globally in so many aspects. And a year after the first case was announced, what has changed in your institution? Does <clears throat> your organization have a crisis management team to manage short-term impacts and initiate appropriate countermeasures in coping with the unprecedented incident? 
uh, perhaps I would like to invite each of the uh, president and vice president to share how your first wave of COVID-19 pandemic handled in your university. Uh, may I invite our home <laughs> guest first, Professor Datuk Bashawi? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rosna. Um, let me take this opportunity to um, express my sincere appreciation to um, Minister of Higher Education Malaysia, um, uh, my colleagues from UKM, Sikabansa and Malaysia, and Professor Nordin uh, from the ACAP um, um, for inviting me to share my views and um, insight or thoughts on a very important topic, um, university leadership in challenging times. Now, um, let me begin um, uh, my thought today by um, uh, quoting Benjamin Franklin. Everybody knows Benjamin Franklin. Um, who remark um, that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Now, um, these statements uh, goes to show the important role that education plays in our life. Now, um, when the world was suddenly um, trusted into turmoil, uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, it has somewhat changed the education landscape dramatically um, and made redundant uh, many well-established learning models being practiced in universities, as we can see now. Now, I must say that Institute of Malaysia was not spared either. And uh, although uh, surprised by it, we cope with the situation rather well and are making good progress towards normalization. Now, this is mainly due to the fact that the university has embarked on aggressive campus digitalization programs since 2018, uh, with the widespread use of massive open online courses on short MOC and open distance learning mode. Now, students and have student and staff health uh, and safety immediately uh, became our utmost priority. Uh, and changes were made to some of the university's long established uh, practices. We quickly instituted a paradigm shift in embracing the new normal. Now, uh, in the context of teaching and learning, we were among the first in Malaysia to make the shift from traditional methods or better known as face to face towards remote learning by online. Now, in other words, widespread use of information technology in our daily operation. This has been the andragogy adopted, and now we are about to introduce the hybrid approach where both methods are to be made available to students. We make a point to listen actively and take all the measures deemed feasible to facilitate our students, need, especially those from remote areas with internet connectivity problems and international ones who are barred from returning to campus for various reasons. Now, with regard to the university workforce, we strictly adhere to the Movement Control Order or MCO and the subsequent standard operating procedures introduced by the government of Malaysia. As we speak, the country is in the second round of MCO and majority of our staff have been instructed to work from home and their attendance is recorded remotely. Now, only those in the essential services are required to be on campus. Classes and administrative lab tasks uh, are conducted remotely via various internet platforms, for example, Webex, uh, Zoom uh, for online and, and other online platforms. Now, when COVID-19 was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization back in March 2020 and became a global health crisis, the Malaysian government was quick to activate the national disaster management uh, response measures that included a nationwide lockdown. Now, in essence, I think the whole country literally came to an abrupt standstill. Now, in response to this development, I took upon myself to practice self leadership and look for various ways to inspire my team and innovate at the same time. I assess the reality that just struck us, look at the contingency plan to address the crisis and instigated immediate actions to address the temporary uh, national lockdown. In UUM, we do have a crisis management committee 
had it by myself. This high level task force consists of all the critical services, elements of the university, such as the academic affairs department, student affairs department, the university health center, the security department, the development and maintenance department, and as well as the university risk management center, to name a few. The committee regularly conduct meetings in order to monitor the situation on the ground. Now, one of the surveillance measures, which I could share this morning, taken by UUM, was to develop the COVID-19 self-assessment, or in short, COTSA, mobile application program, where all the university staff are required to update their health status daily through the smartphones. Now, mm -hmm. staff and students are also encouraged to utilize the MICE uh, uh, um health platforms application that was developed by the government of Malaysia uh, to assist in managing and mitigating the COVID-19 outbreaks in the country. Uh, this allow users <laughs> perform health self-assessment on themselves and their families. UEM also received a grant from the Ministry of Education Malaysia um, to the tune of Ringgit Malaysia, to million Ringgit for the provision of food, ground transportation, and also a few flight tickets to those students who were staying on campus uh, throughout the lockdown period. Uh, the university also received general sponsorship from various parties for a total of Ringgit in Malaysia, 600,000. <laughs> um, so in summary, um, in the context of pandemic COVID-19, which impacted us and, um, and everyone else throughout the world, I think we have done remarkably well to address this issue. Thank you for us. Thank you so much, Dr. Basharil. I think similar experience uh, is uh, experienced by many vice chancellor in Malaysia because we are very mm. much centralized. And I believe all public university in Malaysia has a crisis management team and also risk management uh, committee to oversee, to preempt issues that might affect the quality of teaching in higher education in Malaysia. Thank you so much, Dr. Basharia. Okay, perhaps we can move to South Korea now. Maybe Dr. Mm -hmm. Mu So An would like to share something you experienced from Korea. Mm, first of all, uh, thank you for having me uh, to share the experiences uh, at our university. Of course, uh, the situation after the uh, pandemic is uh, totally different uh, from uh, the situation before. Mm, most of the classes are carried out online in, at our university at the moment. And uh, we apply very strong preventive measure. When I enter one of the buildings at our university, I, uh, first of all, I meet uh, some very strong system for preventive, pre prevention. Mm, I need to check the body temperature at first. And then uh, the employees uh, are spraying. Spraying, uh, spraying, um, spraying uh, uh, disinfectant all the area uh, at our university. Mm. And then well, we established the task force for COVID-19. We meet uh, very often and uh, we take care of uh, all the students and the professors at our university all the time. Especially for the foreign students, we take care of them very carefully. Uh, when, I, when, I, when a student from, um, let's say, um, Malaysia, he will come to our airport and then we go there to take them. And then uh, he will take the PCR test there first and then come to the 14 day quarantine at our dormitory. Oh, so you don't close border for international students to come in? Yes, uh, mm, the foreign students come to come, can come, come here. Uh, okay. But, but uh, right after come, come, coming here, 
he go to okay. to fourteen day quarantine facility. Okay. And then um, after fourteen days, he will get another test for PCR PCR test. And then then if he is affected, he go to hospital very quickly. So it is very restrict, very strong measure. Uh, in in Korea at uh, Jeonbuk National University as well. So the most important thing, thing is uh, uh, prevention uh, prevention of COVID nineteen and uh, the health of uh, students. That is the the most important thing, important thing uh, in this situation at the moment, Korea. Uh, so uh, and. My university is trying to uh, make very attractive online content, attractive uh, online classes as many uh, as possible. So we provide some um, support to professors to make attractive online content. That is a uh, or one of the the the, the uh, strong points of uh, our university. So we try to 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 apply strong preventive measure, and on the other hand, we try to provide uh, some intensives to make uh, attractive online content. That is the, the two main points of our university. Thank you, Doctor Aunt. It seems that teaching is still the, our primary, given primary importance while uh, facing this pandemic, I think throughout the world. So perhaps you can listen experience from Mexico now, Dr. Silva, would you like to share your experience in Mexico? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I really want to thank you the opportunity for sharing this experience we have in Mexico with all of you. As you know, we, we are a comprehensive university, a public university. That's very important to know that we are public university. But I want to point out that we shouldn't co consider that we are, we, this COVID-19, the pandemic, we were dealing with a lot of uncertainties. That makes the challenge uh, thoughtful. So we are working with scientific uncertainty because of the limited understanding of this virus. And we were working with data uncertainty because uh, it's incomplete the information we, we have at that moment to make decisions and also policy uncertainty. So this three types of uncertainty make much more difficult to make decisions. However, I want to point out that since the universities around the world should show the leadership they do have for the sake of the communities, it was very important to, to make decisions, but make decisions based on the information available, the most trustable information. So good decisions should come from good information. And compared with Asia, in the case of the University of Guanajuato, we have three, mo three months time because we, know, we, we knew of the COVID by the end of December. And the first case in Mexico in Guanajuato was Mar in March. So we have three months of experience from Asia. To, to start thinking about how we will deal with this phenomenon. So we, I can say that we made uh, decisions at the early stage of the COVID arrived in Mexico. This enabled the university to implement and to take measures about this technologies that should be used 
to continue the education or the university activities because we made the decision by middle of March to close the university. I can say that we were one of the first universities in Latin America and the first in the state to close the activities, I mean, in person. So we, we have to implement these platforms. We should to turn and re reconfirm, re make a new configuration of the way we teach and we learn because we should move from in-person to online or not presence education. That was very important because it was really a reaction, a reaction from both sides, from the administration, but also from the students and faculty. They were having reactions about why we now how to teach online. We are at the face, face to face teaching methodologies. So that's what really a challenge. So we first, we stop teaching in the university to transport the university or convert the university a online teaching university. Suddenly, that's what really a challenge. So we need to prepare the students to receive courses online, but also faculty members to enable them to develop the competencies to teach online. That was really difficult. And also from the administration, we should train and convert all the administrative process to be able to do that online. And also provide the administration to uh, have the capabilities to do work at home. That was really a challenge. Now it seems to be normal after almost one year, but one year ago it was really thoughtful work. Also, I want to, want to say that and share with you that the university changed also the way they communicate they, to the all different members of the community how do they communicate or inform about the cha change that were happening in, in the institution. So first, we should be sure that the decisions we make uh, were for the sake of the students, that they will sure that they will continue, there will be continuity to obtain the degrees. And we also change because we were in the process of uh, carry out entrance examinations. So we, we changed the entrance examinations methodology and also the process for selection of the new students. There was no fears, there was exam-based exam examination processes, but now we have to do online entrance examination or change based on the uh, history, academic history of the students, based on the, the, uh, also the interviews they can have uh, online. So that was really a challenge, but now it seems to be, I can say this to be accepted by, by the society, because I want to say that the, we were usually a, cl a classic university. So the need to adapt the teaching learning process in academic prog programs was really a challenge that I can say it was solved because of the will of the students, faculty members, and also from the staff of the university to enable and solve all the, the questions that the students and faculty members to have. We also implement how to keep open 24 hours our libraries. And we instead, we have to change all the, the, the bi bibliography, the reference, the books to online ones. So the, those journals that seems to be only for researchers, now they were 
open to all the students. We also have the, the have to provide the, the students to lend them for one semester computers, laptops, or iPads mm. to work from the, their home. So we, we were working with the students to, to let them to continue the, the, their education from their home. Also, we, we have a summer research programs. We uh, did the summer research, but in virtual modality. This was really a good experience because we involved many universities from different countries, students from different countries, and I can say that we also implement a new modality to, for the final examinations of the, the, the presentation of dissertation to gain the degrees were adapted also from online modality. I can say that those, that experience allow us to have a, a supervisors and also members uh, of the of the committee evaluation committee from different countries and from different universities. So the, I can say that this this was very good, but also from the, the I can say that we we have no a crisis management team for COVID, but in in the university we have teams or departments to to cope with crisis from from different different, but we learn also from the uh, the the previous experience of the pandemic influenza, the, the, the H1N1. Okay. So we learned from that, that the best uh, way of facing these problems is having the information, good information on time. So we, we look for that good information to make the decision. And we got that information from our partners from different parts of the world. I can say that we got information from about 44 countries. We have partners in more than 40 countries. So they provide us with the status of the COVID at their country. So that was very good collaboration with also embassies and consulates of different countries and in Mexico, also in other countries. So this, this allowed us to repatriate, to enable the repatriation of students, all even those students that were in Mexico to going back to their home country and also to our students to come back to Mexico. So that was a very good experience. However, I can see that despite that, I can consider that we managed or handled in a good uh, way, the first wave of COVID, we have no learned still what is going to happen for the second state that is the returning. Returning will be very challenged because for us at university it was easier to say, okay, from tomorrow we start online, but it won't be the case from online to now to presence education. So I can say that this, this is the experience we have that we will be facing a higher, uh, I can say a bigger challenge for the returning to presence education. Thank you so much, Dr. Silva, for sharing your wonderful experience. Uh, well, empowerment is a key word and communication you mentioned, uh, even though you don't have the crisis management theme, but each department knows how to direct themselves with good data, well-informed data, and you know, guided uh, by the top management, I think you can do a wonderful job for any institution. Okay, I just noticed Professor Arif just joined us. Maybe I'll give him a few minutes to settle down. Uh, let us move back to, to the topic here. It's interesting when you mentioned about a preparation of welcoming well, back the returning student. Uh, if we can have very quickly, I mean, one minute, for instance, how would you, what are the preparation to welcome the students back now? Are you prepared? Is the university uh, having clear mechanism to welcome them back anytime sooner? Dr. Bashawi, maybe you would like to share UUM strategic uh, plan for this? 
Sure, sure. Um, UM um, view this very seriously. I think um, internationalization has always been a key part of the areas since our inception. Um, I think there are various measures um, that we have taken uh, to address these issues. Uh, I'm sure um, this is not um, uh, only affected UUM, but also it's also affected um, almost every university in the world. Almost everyone is affected by it. I think um, UUM is quite fortunate in the sense that um, um, the brand, University of Utara Malaysia, is very important. We have got the brand already by now, I think after 12 years of inception, I think almost everybody, almost everyone in the uh, in the circles or the community is aware uh, about our presence. We make our presence felt. Um, I think um, um, the brand is very important and it's, it's trustworthiness. Uh, this is going to be our long-term objective. Um, I think with regard to your question, I think um, we are ready uh, to receive um, some of the students back to, to, to Malaysia. In fact, as a matter of fact, the government has just recently announced that they are most welcome uh, to, uh, to enter Malaysia uh, uh, with CFAC March. Uh, of course, with the uh, uh, strictly adherent to the um, um, Ministry of Health Malaysia, mm -hmm. the standard operating procedures, uh, and also the immigration office before they allow us to enter Malaysia. At the same time also, um, we have come up with um, a very um, uh, 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 regimented so-called um, um, uh, programs uh, to receive them back. Um, we provide logistical support, psychological support, and um, this is very important uh, because we don't want to, you know, um, to have um, uh, uh, any, any backlash or even, um, you know, rejection uh, from the part of international students. For us. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bashawe. Perhaps I can move to Professor Ari from APB Indonesia. Uh, you missed the first round just now. We talked about how you handled the first wave of COVID-19 pandemic, how successfully you have managed to overcome some uh, obstacles during the first phase, or, or perhaps now you can also move to internationalization because the topic has been introduced by Dr. Bashawi just now. Because if you notice in our recent uh, 2020 QS survey report entitled how COVID-19 is impacting prospective international students at different study level. Uh, one of the findings mentioned that almost 62% of our students mentioned that I now intend to defer my entry until next year. Well, well this will definitely affect our international recruitment drive. So how would your respective university strategize a possible drop in international student recruitment? Uh, perhaps I'll give a chance for Professor Arif to share IPB experience with us. Yes, well, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your question. It is very, uh, very timely to have discussion with all of you regarding how universities uh, deal with the new situation, what we call is uncertainty. Because now the COVID-19 pandemic is one of the you know, uh, uncertainty and we need to be more agile and more adaptive with, with this new situation. Regarding what is the future of universities, actually now we are uh, of course still uh, preparing uh, with the preference in uh, many, many countries like Australia. Australia now uh, prepare uh, what we call the what scenario one. We call it champion university, scenario two, commercial university, scenario three, structured university, and scenario four, principal university. It is, uh, you know, uh, this is scenario is uh, very, very important. But one of the components of this scenario is about the virtual university. In these virtual universities, where the rural governments is very low, and then the students, uh, they don't need a uh, specific, specific course, unbundled course. So there is the freedom for the students to choose what kind of the curricula uh, what uh, they need. Regarding uh, local relevance, ladies and gentlemen, now everybody now at home, now work from home, uh, now uh, online uh, learning uh, we develop, 
what was the more most important thing? It is the opportunity for the students to have the special activity in around around their hometown. For example, uh, we have many many students uh, now is located in in many in, in all province in Indonesia, and then uh, we have the specific program for them, actually in a service learning program or field program. In this field program, it is very important for the students to learn from the, the reality, the reality around them, and then see how they can uh, collaborate with the community, and then talk, and, and also they have to, to make the education about the COVID-19. And I think it's very, very important because the students become the role model, role model in uh, preparing, you know, uh, how how do you, Professor Arif? How do you handle service learning during pandemic? Are you going into e service learning? I don't. Hello. You you mentioned your student are into service learning project with the yes. community, but during pandemic, yes. how do you sustain service learning without face to face yes. interaction? Are you moving yes. into e service learning? Yes, uh, we we do service learning, and uh, we don't uh, use service learning online. We use in the reality. So, for example, in one city like in Bogor, in Bogor, uh, for example, there are the students in the semester six, because uh, in the semester six they have to do something uh, in the field uh, because uh, uh, service learning program, and then they do in the interaction with the community they have to educate about how to anticipate with the you know the COVID how to you know uh, apa, you know uh, how to just yes, like the transfer knowledge and then they have to campaign to campaign to the community uh, how to you know for example to uh, strengthen the immunity how to uh, what kind of the consumption we we need to do uh, to to keep to to maintain our health and then the campaigns how to uh, you know to use mask yeah? and then uh, to keep distance is something like that so uh, they do uh, many activities in the field with the health protocol it's very very strict health protocol so it is of course it is very risky it is very risky so we need to have the you know coordination with the uh, COVID COVID center in the ill in, in the each each uh, town. We have to make coordination, and then also the students who interested to join this program, they have to get uh, permission from their parents. Okay. And another one is yeah, we, I ask we, you we because in Mal yeah, I yes, ask you because in Malaysia we promote. Oh, there must be delay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I asked this question earlier. Because in Malaysia, yeah. we promote uh, e-service learning and uh, e-sulam, we call it, is project, yeah. a nationwide project. Because during this pandemic, our students cannot go to the ground. So we really promote uh, e-learning solution for service learning, actually. I wonder if that is yeah. also happening in Indonesia. Yeah. Yes, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, for preparing uh, the students to go to the field, we do by online, well, uh, learning uh, like training center, and then uh, after that, the students for two months uh, get in touch with the community in the fields to make the education, to make campaign and so on. That. And that's under supervision from the government. So we, of, of course, we have to to keep the student, we have to protect the student from the COVID. So uh, I think it is what uh, we can uh, do. And then uh, the second issue is about the research, I think, yes. Uh, collaborative research with national and global partners uh, now is kept uh, being conducted in, in the local university is asked to participate. So uh, especially the research regarding uh, COVID pandemic. The last one is about capacity building program. Uh, we develop uh, this capacity building program in many ways, especially during COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID pandemic. Many online events have been conducted, including on-site training following COVID-19 uh, protocol. I think train, training for COVID-19 protocol is very important, especially for the low-educated people in the field. Because we also focus uh, not 
only in the town, but also of course in, in the village area. If uh, many uh, COVID-19 pandemic happen in the town, in the city, it is, will be problem on economy. But if there's problem of COVID in the, in the village area, it will be very, very dangerous for our life. That's right. We have to, 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 to educate, to campaign the villagers about the, about the danger of COVID and then how we have to, to keep our health to uh, deal with the COVID. Thank you, Professor Arif, for your sharing. Uh, I'm sorry, the, then, the line is yes, not uh, pretty. One, one yeah. more. Uh, okay. Last okay. one is last one is about the national government have the policy policy to encourage the students to go to the field, to go to the village area, to stay oh. with them, and then for education, and then we can count count for them uh, for credit. Credit earning from the field activities in the field. It is the national policy of the government. So it is the good even during policy, pandemic. But it is encouraged the students to do that. Even during pandemic, they were allowed to go to the field. Yes, but uh, okay. with the, the health uh, with close supervision uh, protocol, especially activities uh, related to COVID pandemic anticipation. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. It seems it's that you really empower the students. Recovery. Yeah. yeah, it seems that you really empower the student to take an adult roles to together combat this pandemic. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We, I think we have seen how each university has, you know, handled uh, the first wave of the pandemic successfully. But we have question here. The first question I want to entertain here is from Dr. Sharifa Munira al Atas. Can the speakers please comment on how globalization has negatively impacted the quality of higher education worldwide because universities around the world compete for top students, which makes global education about student mobility. Maybe you can address issues uh, about competition and its impact on the quality, especially on the social sciences and humanities research and publication of university academic. And what you see as the post COVID 19 role of university leadership in the intellectual growth of educators in those social sciences, in social sciences and humanities. Uh, I open to the panel. Anyone would like to pick up this question? Maybe Dr. An? Mm -hmm. Sorry. We have a question from the audience. Can you comment on, on that? Or anyone of the uh, panel would like to pick up this question? How globalization has negatively impacted the quality of higher education worldwide, especially from the social sciences and humanities? I mean, in terms of research and publication of university academic, etc. Anyone would like uh, to pick up that Dr. question? Let me just uh, yeah. quickly respond. Yeah. I mean, it's a, yeah. it's a very broad and, and, and general question. It's, in, uh, it's not going to be easy to answer it. But uh, I think um, uh, with regard to the university's um, uh, response to globalization, I think um, it varies from one country to another. Uh, it's not fully aware of uh, there is a wide disparity uh, in terms of internet connectivity um, in, in, you know, um, among countries, even within countries. So in the context of Malaysia, those living in the rural um, may not have um, you know, the same quality of internet facilities as opposed to those living in the urbans. So these are some of the issues that I think every government in the world are trying their level best to address it. Um, well, um, uh, in the case of Malaysia, I'm optimistic. I mean, um, uh, uh, the government of Malaysia vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, education, I think they are doing their level best. In fact, we are working closely with the telecommunication providers and, and various parties to address these issues. Uh, I think as far as in software as the quality is concerned, uh, I think um, we, we're not going to, to compromise it. Um, uh, it. It's just that um, uh, uh, um, technology is not just a tool, it's just an enabler. Uh, but what is important is that knowledge is imparted. Knowledge transfer. These are key issues that um, I think everybody must uh, uh, 
uh, seriously ponder and, 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 and think deep. How do we address this issue? Um, well, I don't think quality is going to be um, diluted or diminished whatsoever because of the pandemic. Um, um, uh, I think pandemic is just, it's just, it's just a temporary phenomenon. When it is over, everybody will be back to the universities, back to where they were, uh, campuses, uh, you know, they are currently enrolled. And, and, and once that um, uh, situation, once situation is improved, I think um, uh, things will return to normalcy. I think, I think uh, again, my, my quick response to that is that uh, it will, I think it will affect, but will not uh, in a way uh, diluted or diminish the quality of education at all. Probably. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Bashari. Uh, Dr. An, you would like to add something to this? Mm -hmm. mm, my major is uh, uh, international politics. So in studying and uh, in doing research in international politics, it, the, the important thing is the communication, communication each other, talking each other. Uh, in the process of communication, I can get something. I can get some some ins uh, inspiration. But uh, in this uh, uh, dire situation, we cannot communicate uh, very care uh, very effectively. And then the, the second thing is, uh, it is very hard to carry out field work in social science. Mm, Doing document survey is one part, and the other part is field work. We go some field, and uh, we do some interviews, and uh, uh, by doing this kind of uh, work, we can go uh, to the in-depth study. But uh, the pandemic prevents us from doing this kind of very important thing. So uh, in academia, the pandemic is very dangerous thing, I think. Okay, thank you, Dr. An. I think I'm going to move to the very important pertinent issue for this session today. It's about future university. Because we, mm. have, we have about 20 more minutes left here. Well, let mm. us address what, is, what should be the future university? Because as a whole world is redefining all sectors of our life, do you think we should also rethink and redefine how universities are being assessed and ranked mm -hmm. and thus is gaining global prominence still a game changer that differentiates universities? Oh, what sure. do you think? <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting um, question for us now. Uh, um, again, it's not, it's not going to be easy to answer, but um, I, I, I believe um, the only thing that is causing is change. Um, the future holds many possibilities and uncertainties. Um, I think we should uh, brace ourselves uh, for any eventualities that another health crisis would strike the world again. We never know. It could be next year, it could be in five years, there'll be another pandemic. Um, um, I think Malaysia doing pretty well. Malaysia is practices um, open economy. Uh, it's gradually you know, transiting slowly but surely um, towards um, a knowledge and innovation-based economy. Uh, I think the emphasis now on the part of the government is on innovation and upskilling of our human resources. We have uh, abundant supply of good quality human resources. Uh, just the creation of, I think, knowledge and, and, and noble thinking processes, uh, I think pivotal, that underpin the fourth industrial revolution 4.0. Um, I think our academia, you know, um, I think must seriously undertake a paradigm shift, I think, uh, by blending academic and career-oriented motif uh, into that that contributes to the overgrowth of the economy. Um, so you still that believe that gaining global prominence is still a game changer in for yes. future university? Yes, yes. Exactly. Okay. 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 Thank you, Dr. Bashari. Maybe we hear from Dr. Uh, Silva from Mexico. Sure. Thank you. Actually, I want to also uh, contribute to the previous one because I do consider that globalization is a existing phenomenon, and even hmm. social science cannot de de deny 
that this globalization exists. So I cannot say that if globalization impacted the quality of your programs for better or for worse. So that's complicated. But I can say that this globaliza globalization has promoted what in a traditional way we call social learning process. It accelerated the social learning process. So the, the information that is shared is easier to be converted into knowledge. And this knowledge can uh, generate understanding not only in the local context, but also in the global context and maybe arrive to collaboration in terms of academia, research, or the social and economic development. I just want to point out that, point out that about the, the, the future universities of the, of the, of, or the future of the universities, I want to say that uh, we should consider that, uh, that these, uh, the universities were founded. The foundation of universities have reasons that differ from university to university. So assess university based on stereotypes, universities, or based on research or industry income, or it, it, it should be not the ideal about how to assess university. I, I think that the assess of the university should go back to review the mission, mission of the universities. Uh, if this university was founded in the principles to attain local needs, we should develop, consider that at the moment we assess the performance of any universities. Of course, future universities should be based on the, the previous routes but also take care of the development of scientific, technological, social, and also consider the new ways of learning. We, with, with this pandemic, we have learned that after the pandemic, things will not be the same. The, the, the students will accept e-learning, uh, administrative or staffs will be also accept to do work at home. Mm -hmm. And also teachers will have the opportunity to use, use e-learning, for example, to have the opportunity to attend to symposiums, to conference, to Congress, without leaving students, without teaching. So that's very important. So universities of the future so, should be those flexible universities but flexible that also don't, don't lose their humanity reasons that founded this university. So I want to say that they are a flexible university that also is focused on social, economic, and technological, mm -hmm. and be able to prepare better students, more integrated students, not only with technical skills, but also with humans to enable them to understand different societies, different ways of thinking and ways of see the world. So this is very important. The, the, the elements that new, a new university should have much more than, uh, of course, rankings are important, but should be not the the end of the university is not the mission complied with rankings. So we should consider that the first mission of the students is to present, contribute to the development of the local society. Of course, contribute to the global development is important, but we should consider that this kind of the universities for the future are also important. If I may exactly. add, for us now, uh, yes. if I may add uh, a, a bit um, on this particular issue, um, some of us in the industry are um, seriously discussing the concept of outsourced university. Now, uh, I think this is a new terminology whereby this public-private partnership, I think, will in the long term uh, benefit the campus community, especially our students. I think I think this arranged arrangement um, allows, I think. Um, um, uh, students 
that is spending only half of the student days on campus, um, while you know honing the theoretical, um, you know, understanding, and the other half in the industry, you know, of choice towards competing. I think their uh, their studies. I think there are also some universities. I think uh, are also looking into um, um, establishing a consortium. I think like alliances of mutual I think interests. Um, you know, similar to COVAX, a consortium or akin to COVAX, a consortium of vaccine providers. I think we should also explore a consortium of education providers, you know, spearheaded maybe by, by, by United Nations, which is similar to COVAX, spearheaded by World Health Organization. And, and, and I foresee, and I honestly foresee that this new form of diplomacy, you know, will bolster cooperation between countries I will be having similar quality of education throughout the world, sharing similar approach you know, as an economic diplomacy that Malaysia, I think, is seriously and aggressively uh, propagating now. Okay, of thank course. you very much, Dr. Bashar. Yes. Well, we, must, yeah. we must uh, consider that the concept and configuration of the future universities, for sure, is going to change. It's not going to Okay, thank you, gentlemen. I think it's very interesting when you mention a consortium working together, because currently we also have uh, lots of MOUs already with international partnerships. I think it's time for us to consolidate and move forward with a better uh, concerted effort to achieve our common goals in higher education. I would like to move to Korea now to Dr. Mu Soo An. Because we know Korea has very strong industrial university partnership. How does this pandemic affect your relationship and shape the future of university in Korea, for instance? Yeah, um, the strategy uh, for our university is uh, trying to uh, try to to make a lot of consortium and uh, MOUs with uh, uh, especially Asian countries, um, such as. Uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore. But uh, the pandemic is a very um, um, important thing at the moment. But uh, we try to uh, uh, communicate each other um, by online and we try to, to give and take by online curriculum and on, online uh, system. But uh, um, I think in this situation, one of the most thing is uh, trying to their own um, specialty, trying to trying to develop their own you know, strong point. Um, um, a lot of um, universities are trying to be to be prominent in the world, but uh, uh, yeah, in this kind of uh, strategy. So um, there is a possibility that uh, that kind of uh, university lose their one strong point. So uh, we try to make our strong point more strong and then communicate with uh, international uh, uh, foreign uh, universities. So, uh, so uh, we try to invest it and you try to establish it our very strong department or very strong um, program um, for uh, domestic student and the international student, and then try to promote that kind of strong uh, department and uh, program to the world. That is our, our strategy to get more attraction from foreign countries. <laughs> Okay. Okay. If I can go back to you, Dr. An, uh, we are curious to know your relationship with the industry mm -hmm. because we know universities and Korea work closely with industry, strong support from industry. How does COVID-19 pandemic affect this relationship between university and industry? In what way is the relationship affected or, or not at all affected? Mm, it it affected a bit, but uh, I don't think it is uh, very um, serious. 
because that in the, in the, in industry, uh, we can we can develop the industry and industry industrial engineering and industrial studies um, by online. So um, we we try to to uh, communicate and we try to uh, give and take a, a very important knowledge and uh, uh, information by online and uh, um, even telephone and. Sometimes we go there, and sometimes we, we invite uh, some industrial uh, engineering part or industrial uh, people. So um, I don't think it is a very uh, serious problem. It is it is okay. it affected a bit, but uh, it is not a serious problem. <laughs> All right, right. Thank you. Well, well, I received quite a number of questions here, but most of the questions focus a lot on the teaching, the quality of teaching and learning at higher education. Maybe I can pick up, I can summarize a few. Uh, for instance, from Alvaras Torres Francisco, what is the future for face-to-face -face university? Is it going to disappear? Wow. <laughs> so can I ask to perhaps Dr. Professor Arif from EP Bay, what do you think? What's the future of university? Are you there? He's not there. Um, Oh, okay, maybe I move to Professor Silva. Yes, yeah, so actually, I can say that it's not going to disappear, the face-to-face -face university, because you know, uh, of course, the, the e-learning is very important and it will be, uh, become more popular from now, but uh, the, the experience, the uh, skills you develop to, during the all activities that you can do face-to-face are not uh, going to disappear. You need those, those uh, skills, for example, to, to enable to understand the behavior of others and also to make you more, uh, how can I say, uh, to develop the skills to work in teams and also to collaborate and to enable to work not only with, with, with men and ladies, but from your, your own community, but also from different communities, people with different backgrounds, with different interests that commute in face-to-face -face classrooms. So I, I am sure that it's not going to disappear, but also I'm sure that e-learning is going to, to become more fruitful and because my, much more become the new lifestyle <laughs> educational programs will be developed now from the beginning to be taught in, in systems in this pandemic this pandemic forced us to adopt our programs to e-learning but now if we develop programs from the beginning to be taught uh, in in e-learning modes the, the or the learning will be much more benefited. Uh, Professor, okay, if, if I may add, yeah. uh, Professor, yeah. it is very interesting okay. um, a discussion or discussion with regard to the whether um, um, the, the, the present form of, uni of university will be replaced entirely by so-called online learning. Very interesting. But I wish to throw um, a caution in the discussion about the future which seems uh, to be dominated by technology and remote learning experiences. I think, um, in, my, in my opinion, uh, they seem to be many advantages uh, you know, with regard to online learning. But at the same time, there are also many detriments to it, you know, uh, such as the lack of soft skill development, for instance, a lack of synergy, rapport with others, and focusing more on theory rather than practice. I think um, we all human. I think um, naturally human nature dictates that, 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 that some things uh, cannot be taught. There must be experience, touch, feelings. You will never learn this, you know, lessons, your lessons uh, and in life until you go through this journey. That's my quick response to it, Professor. Thank you. Yes, true, Dr. Bashawe, because university learning is not about knowledge seeking, knowledge uh, transmission 
only, but it's also about social interaction, about life on campus. The four mm. years uh, living on campus is something that uh, normally is memorable time for most of us, actually. So I think I would like to go to the last question. Maybe I, I give each uh, of you about two minutes to talk about your future. How do you plan to bring your university to the next level, looking at the current situation? Because we have the new lifestyle now. There's no longer ERT. There's no longer emergency remote teaching. It's real remote teaching and improved remote teaching. And it has become part of our lifestyle now. So what is your plan then to bring your university to the next level, 2021 onwards? Maybe we'll start with uh, Professor uh, Arif, are you still there? Oh, I. I saw uh, a different participant now. now. I am representing uh, Professor Ayub Yeah. Okay. <laughs> would, would you like to? Yeah. Of IBB University. Yeah. Please welcome yeah, Dr. Because, Professor, uh, Professor Didi. Yeah. Because Professor Ayub just uh, have a meeting with the minister. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, okay. We have uh, fortunately. Yeah. We we fortunately have uh, uh, pre prepared uh, online uh, system. Yeah. For our not only only learning system but all administrative system at IBB University has been uh, 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 electronically uh, with internet uh, of things yeah and uh, uh, of course uh, there are some uh, activities that uh, cannot conducted uh, by e-learning for example uh, for the faculty of veterinary medicine for example because it is not yeah. possible to uh, uh, learn injection to the animal yeah, with the online uh, system. <laughs> I think uh, they have to practice in the animal hospital. And also uh, uh, student uh, service learning, uh, we have uh, what we call it uh, KKN domicily or a student service learning. So we have a uh, learning service of the students. So they uh, make activity, all activities in uh, their hometown. So it is uh, make uh, much easier for the students uh, to uh, uh, make a face-to-face -face, uh, student service learning uh, with a minimum uh, risk uh, due to the pandemic. I think this is uh, the planning of our university in the future. Okay, now, thank already. you, Professor <laughs> Didi from IPB. Okay, maybe Dr. An, would you like to share your plan to mm -hmm. bring university to the next level in Korea? Mm, let me explain the situation in, in South Korea. Mm. Many students don't come to university and they stay uh, stay home and they watch a lot of videos through mm -hmm. YouTube or Facebook or some other SNS. But uh, that kind of commercial video or uh, clip is very interesting, very attractive. So they... Uh, the students are used to be familiar with, with that kind of, that kind of uh, attractive and interesting uh, video clips. So um, professors should be more attractive. Mm. So, so process, uh, the teachers in, uh, at universities has uh, two tasks. One should uh, teach very what is it? In depth studies, deep studies, deep knowledge. And the, the, the second task is that kind of uh, teaching should be interesting, should be attractive. So we try to um, make very interesting, attractive um, the classes. Uh, even after the pandemic, even after um, still they came to university, they expect more input, more uh, interesting classes, more attractive classes, because they experienced a lot, a lot of uh, interesting video clips. So we try to um, support professors to make interesting classes, to make mm -hmm. attractive classes. That is uh, our strategy to upgrade our education. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. An, you just uh, respond to one question actually. But people have been asking how university has been doing 
to help mitigate the psychosocial effect, mental health of the staff and students. I think what you mentioned just now is training, retraining of staff, supporting them to provide quality materials. I think those are among the way forwards for the university, providing supporting ecosystem to help the student and also the academic to become more agile, more adaptive to the new digital education context. Uh, of course, uh, we can see throughout the world, there's a diversity among us, the academic, some very techno savvy, some pretty traditional, but the traditional one has to move on if they want to remain relevant in higher education for years to come, I believe. Mm. And, and I also agree with Dr. Bashawir mentioned that face-to-face -face won't go away, even though uh, we have some uh, response here saying that face-to-face uh, -face is foregone, <laughs> it's a long tradition, but, uh, but many people believe there is a need for face-to-face -face because we're dealing with human. Uh, and, and I would like to bring to, uh, if I can share, I think one thing about uh, if there is any silver lining in this pandemic, I think is the democratization of higher education by giving opportunity for students to access broad knowledge, broad education via online learning. Now they can listen to great professors from MIT, from Harvard. Mm -hmm. I mean, every, now it's suddenly uh, online learning has become a trend, a lifestyle. And I think that's the future. And then, but what, these are the challenges. How do we support this kind of future without good financial model? So I would like to ask, what would be the future sustainable financial model for the university to provide all the support to academic and to students in universities? Uh, it is a quick response from you, Professor. Now I think. Um, yeah, being expert in business, maybe Dr. Bashar, we can share your, you know, how do you envision the financial yeah, think, model for the university? Yes, I think I think I, I've responded partially uh, uh, early on on my proposal on the establishment of the consortium, Professor. Now I think that's going to be a uh, key, and in whatever we do in the foreseeable future, um, I think it's going to be more dynamic and fluid. Um, I think consortium, which we should seriously consider a consortium of higher education. And in Malaysia, we have got 20 um, public institutions of higher learning, which receive grants annually from the government. I think it's high time that the government uh, seriously look into this matter and, and strategize carefully the way forward. Um, uh, uh, um, I think discussion is ongoing, I believe. And in the case of, of, of UUM, I think um, uh, we will come up has crisis stronger, I think with resolve, I think not to uh, overreact, not to overreact, but I think um, calmly and methodically build confidence in our stakeholders. I think that's key. I think, um, uh, as I said, as I commented earlier also, with regard to our brand and whatnot, I think um, we have received, um, a, a, you know, a very positive response from the industry as well. Um, how do we move on from here? Some of the activity may be outsourced, you know, students may not, be, may not, may not, may not have, you know, uh, to stay on campus, the entire academic programs, uh, they can always, they can just stay with us for maybe uh, two years and the remaining two years at the industry. So these are uh, the, the future orientation of higher education uh, for Malaysia, I think, for us now. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Bashawe. Any final last words from uh, Dr. An? Before Sorry. we close the session, yeah. Any final words from you? Or, or Dr. Silva, any final words from one sure, of our universities? I, I want to, to share with you that based on this experience of the COVID pandemic, uh, I can say that it, the COVID pushed the university to accelerate its process to establish the digital university or digital campus. So we are preparing for the future of the education, e-learning by establishing this uh, digital campus. Through this digital campus, we do offer our programs, not only in Mexico, but also in all the Spanish speaker 
uh, countries. There are 20, 21 countries who where is, is Spanish is spoken. Even in the United States, I can, I can say that in the United States, there are about 13 million Mexican. So we, we can offer the opportunity to be educated, uh, I mean, to complete their uh, elementary education uh, or gain degree from the, 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 the country they, 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 they are. This is very important because uh, if we consider that IT, the industry, industry 4.0 is very important to democratize the education, but also to offer opportunities the, the, of, to people from all around the world. Also, this IT offered the opportunities to generate new universities who really work in a collaborative way. That means that really work together not only on research, not only in students' mobility, but also on, on uh, granting double degree programs. That will be very important and very convenient for future students. And also to have the input from different uh, e-learning models and e-learning programs maybe will uh, draw, will be able to, to generate this liquid professionals, professionals that can be adapted to any conditions of the industry, of the government, so that that will be very important. So that's why the University of Guanajuato is working on developing this digital campus, not only to obtain or gain financial support, but also to mm -hmm. contribute to the democratization of the education in the world. Well, thank you, Dr. Silva. You aptly said about the democratization of higher education worldwide now. Perhaps the Bologna process is now becoming a global, not simply restricted to European countries. Uh, any final words from Dr. An and also from IP Bay? We are coming to the end of the session. Maybe I'll give you one minute, Dr. An. Anything? Yeah. Mm. Oh, we are facing a very difficult time at the moment. But uh, after pandemic, we needed to uh, develop our, our uh, classes. We, need, we should develop our uh, classes. Mm. Even though we can access the uh, um, online content from Harvard or MIT, I think the, you know, the um, person two person classes are very important at, uh, for all time. So, um, if, uh, if we try to, to uh, overcome the challenge from uh, very good uh, online content from abroad, we need to develop our own person-to-person -person, um, classes at our university, uh, at uh, our all universities. That is, uh, that is uh, one of our strategy to develop our university. Okay. Thank you, Dr. An. And one second, Rosna. Just be one second. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> one minute. I thought because we are coming to the end. Right. <laughs> okay. I, think, I think the key to remember, always remember, uh, um, a knowledge still needs to be imparted to learners. I think in a manner that incorporates both realism and experience and meaningful. That's it. That's from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And from IPB, last word from IPB. Much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at IBB, we uh, not only uh, develop uh, online uh, learning system, but we develop also uh, the digital uh, program for the villagers and farmers. For example, uh, we uh, develop uh, precision agriculture that help uh, farmer uh, digitalizing of uh, agriculture system uh, for uh, the what is this, uh, uh, fertilizer, yeah, for example. And also, uh, we uh, develop also a uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, environment uh, system in the uh, village yeah, by uh, uh, supporting to uh, develop what we call it uh, a startup for uh, the village, yeah? uh, CEO, young CEO in the village. It is also uh, uh, what I have already developed with uh, 52 villages in uh, West Java province. And uh, now uh, we just try to uh, develop in other province. 
I think it is also very important uh, in the future. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you so much, gentlemen. Well, the future of higher education may seem uncertain for now, but we have heard how we can redefine, recreate, and reinvent learning experiences for the future. So again, thank you so much to Professor Arif Satria for joining us from Indonesia, Professor Sergio Antonio Silva Munoz for joining us from Mexico, Dr. Mu Su An for joining us from South Korea, and joining us from UUM Malaysia, Professor Dr. Dr. Ahmad Bashawir Haji Abdogani. And to our loyal participants out there and on Zoom and FB Live, thanks a bunch for being a very engaged audience. I noticed lots of questions, but I I notice also the question uh, mainly pertains to quality teaching learning. Maybe UKM should uh, conduct another forum on improving the quality teaching and learning. Again, thank you so much for uh, all the distinguished uh, speakers and also UKM for giving us time for deliberate on this important issue today. So without further ado, I hand over the session to Dr. Tanot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Rosna Wang Hashim and all the distinguished panelists for such an inspiring discussion. May it Thank be you. a light to guide our feet to move further in internalizations and prove that extends our relevance as a strategic institutions of the higher education. Ladies and gentlemen, this fourth webinar is the last of it under the collaborative partnerships of ACAP and UKM and planning began even before the pandemic. Thanks to all your support, we have now completed the series. To commemorate the closing event of this, this event and partnership, we would like to invite Yambo Bahagia, Secretary General, Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia, Dato Sri Dr. Mazlan Yusuf, for closing remarks. Yambo Bahagia, Dato Sri, the screen is yours. Yambo Haman, Dato Sri, Dr. Norani Ahmad, Minister of Higher Education Malaysia, Professor Dr. Norden Yahya, Director, Higher Education Leadership Academy or ACAP Malaysia, Professor Dr. Dr. Ikhwan Haji Toriman, Vice Chancellor, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Professor Dr. Dr. Ahmad Bashawir Haji Abdul Ghani, Vice Chancellor, University Utara Malaysia, Professor Dr. Arif Satria, Rector IPB University Indonesia, Dr. Moon Suk An, Vice President for International Affairs, Junbuk National University, South Korea, Dr. Sergio Antonio Silva Munoz, Provost for Academic Affairs, the University of Guanajuato, Mexico. Professor Dr. Rosna Awang Hashim, Academy of Professors Malaysia and Musi Utara Malaysia, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Warm greetings from the Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia. My fellow speakers and participants, thank you very much for the interesting and invigorating discussion. My gratitude to all presidents who have given their time and dedication, and also to the moderator for managing such an interesting intellectual discourse. I trust that all of you have listened to the four renowned university presidents on the issues faced and the way forward. Indeed, I believe there is so much that we can learn and gain from their experience and knowledge imparted during the session. For those of you who have closely followed the University President's Forum, you may have realized that ACAP with University Kebasaan Malaysia have conducted four series all together. We have now reached the, the end of the University President Forum as it is the last series for the forum as a whole. Thus, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to those who involved in ensuring that the forum is a success, particularly 
the Higher Education Leadership Academy or ACAD and its University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Despite the pandemic, the program managed to gather university presidents across the globe to share their insights and thoughts on issues surrounding the international higher education landscape, especially in our current challenging situation filled with many uncertainties. Thanks to the availability of technology and webinars application tools, we are able to meet and share experiences and knowledge that would benefit the higher education landscape. Ladies and gentlemen, as we have arrived to the last part of this wonderful series, I can conclude that the platform has imparted relevant and important knowledge not just locally but also globally. I have been informed that the number of participants recorded was exceedingly high where in each series a total number of around 500 registered participants and around 5,000 viewers on social media. This is indeed something for us to be proud of and ACAP and UKM could have not done this without your strong support. As you have heard this morning in the Sri Noraini's welcoming speech, the minister had mentioned about the ministry's way forward, which is to focus on internationalization of programs. And I believe that ACAP and UKM have taken the challenge to address the needs of the ministry and also the country. Although there were challenges in conducting this program, both parties have overcome the obstacles and delivered their best in ensuring the success of this program. Ladies and gentlemen, throughout the series in the University President's Forum, we could see that to be a true leader in higher education, one needs to have a hard guided leadership trait, such as agility, compassion, tolerance, courtesy, intelligence, and wisdom. It is through the conversation and discussion using this platform that the presidents are challenged with questions relating to their experience strategies and their vision for the institution's future. If we follow the discussion thoroughly, we will be able to critically analyze the values, vision and knowledge of a higher education leader. The Ministry and ACAP as a leadership academy wish to train and inspire more leaders and also academics in higher education to gain knowledge and obtain skills relevant to the situation today. In line with the world's current dynamics, as I have mentioned earlier, technology allows leaders to exchange innovative ideas using the interactive system to foster collaboration in order to work collaboratively with others in shaping and producing good leaders, tools such as the competency framework to assist in profiling the academic leaders, trainings such as QALB guided leadership, human governance in leadership, strategic collegial management, persona of a leader, facets of higher education and open forums, intellectual discourses such as the University President Forum and Leadership Talk series are important to nurture the leadership values and competencies. These types of initiatives will help the academic leaders to gain the skills and knowledge regarding leadership in order to perform their tasks 
not only as an academic and researcher, but also as a leader. This is the focus and aim of ACAP as a leadership academy. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a wonderful journey throughout all the four series of the University President's Forum. Once again, I would like to thank and congratulate all parties involved, particularly the teams from ACAP and UKM for making the vision of the Ministry of Higher Education of Malaysia a reality. To everyone who has followed the series from its inception, my thanks to you too. Although this is the last series with UKM, it is definitely not the end of it. The next round of University President Forum will be conducted with the University of Malaysia Sabah or UMS. Do stay tuned as the next forum is scheduled sometime in the third quarter of the year and I'm sure UMS will be able to engage renowned presidents and leaders to discuss important topics relating to higher education, particularly the ones that lead to a better future for higher education. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a great honor for me to be able to witness the success of the University President's Forum. And thank you again to all for making this program a success. I would like to end my speech with a quote on leaders by Ronald Reagan. The greatest leader is not necessarily the one who does the greatest things. He is the one that gets the people to do the greatest things. Therefore, fellow speakers and audience, be great leaders, continue to inspire others, and success will definitely follow. With that, I hereby close the session today. Thank you and till we meet again. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Yama Bahagia Datuk Sri Dr. Maslan Yusuf, for such a lovely words. Indeed, the past webinar sessions have imparted valuable lessons and best practices that have benefited the attendees. Now, we would like to memorialize, memorialize our today webinar with photo sessions for the panelists, moderators, and representatives from UGAM. We'd like to welcome Professor Dr. Osman Karim um, and from ACAP, Professor Dr. Nordin Yahya. Well done, okay. Well done. Well done. Ready? One. Okay, thank you so much. We have now approached the end of our webinar. On behalf of organizers, we would like to thank the presidents and the representative and the international office of University of Utara, Malaysia, IPB University, Bogor, Indonesia, University of Guanajuato, Mexico, and John Book National University, South Korea, for their cooperations in realizing today's event. Our esteemed international office of local university, our partner university from across the globe, the embassies and consulate representative, and also the technical team from the faculties of Medicine UKM for the technical support. A special thanks to ACAP for believing in us in co-organizing the event and the support provided making the series a success. Thank you to the Ministry of Higher Education for their constant support in ensuring the global impact of this event. Before we end this webinar, we would like to cordially invite all of you to upcoming seminar by ACAP on value-based leadership and value-based performance 2021. It is a two-day seminar from 15 to 16 February this is e-search seminar and registrations are required. For the info, please browse ACAP website and Facebook. All in all, I'm Tano Unja, sign off here as your MC. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Muchas gracias. Am Sam Nida. Till we meet again. Salam. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much from University of Kubang. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Prof. Nordin. Thank you, Prof. Nordin. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Nordin. Thank you, Prof. Nordin. Well done. Thank you, Nordin. Thank you, Prof. Nordin. Prof. Yaz. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. And Dr. Rosna. Dr. Rosna, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation.